Tanya Weber, a bright and compassionate 17-year-old, was the pride of her family and a role model to her younger siblings. She had her whole life ahead of her, filled with dreams and ambitions. But on June 26, 1965, all of that was cruelly taken away, as she was found strangled and hidden just blocks from her home. With twists, setbacks, and an unexpected breakthrough nearly 60 years later, this case is a chilling reminder of how justice, though delayed, can still be served. Tanya Weber was born and raised in the quiet, picturesque town of Logan, Utah. Growing up, Tanya played a crucial role in her family as the eldest of five children. Her siblings, especially her younger sister, Rhonda Weber Christensen, looked up to her as a role model and confidant. Tanya attended Logan High School, where she was a senior in 1965. As graduation approached, Tanya looked forward to the next chapter of her life, filled with optimism and excitement about what the future held. On the morning of June 26, 1965, the lifeless body of 17-year-old Tanya Weber was found on Logan's West Center Street, hidden in the bushes of a nearby home. The discovery was made just two blocks from her family's house. Tanya had been strangled, and her body was found partially naked. The Logan Police Department, aided by state authorities, embarked on a massive effort to uncover any leads. Over the course of the investigation, officers interviewed approximately 1,000 people, casting a wide net in hopes of finding someone who might have seen or heard something that could break the case wide open. Out of the extensive list of interviewees, police managed to gather statements from 150 individuals who had potential information related to the crime. These statements were meticulously analyzed for any clues that could point to the perpetrator. As investigators combed through the evidence, they also focused on the physical evidence collected from the crime scene. Among the items collected were Tanya's clothes, which were carefully examined for any forensic evidence that might lead to a suspect. The investigation took a significant turn several days after Tanya's body was discovered. Based on the evidence and witness statements, the Logan police were able to identify a suspect, 26-year-old Owen Hodges Kimball. While some believed the police had found their man, others were skeptical, unsure of whether the evidence against him would be enough to secure a conviction. The investigation into Tanya's case now intensified. Witness statements collected during the investigation suggested that Kimball had been seen near the scene around the time of Tanya's demise. This crucial detail seemed to place him at the heart of the crime, raising suspicions that he might have been involved in the tragic events of that night. For the investigators, it was a lead worth pursuing, and they focused their efforts on building a case against Kimball. However, the case took a sudden and unexpected turn just days later. On June 30, 1965, Kimball's family reported him missing, raising alarms among both his loved ones and the authorities. The search for Kimball ended in Logan Canyon, where police discovered his lifeless body inside his car. The scene was grim, and it quickly became apparent that Kimball had taken his own life. With the prime suspect now deceased, the police faced a significant setback. Despite the statements placing Kimball near the scene, there was no concrete evidence directly linking him to Tanya's case. The lack of definitive proof meant that no additional suspects emerged, and the investigation began to stall. For 59 long years, the case remained cold. In 2022, after nearly six decades of uncertainty, the cold case was reopened. The Logan Police Department, determined to bring closure to the long, unsolved case, sought the assistance of the Assault Kit Initiative Grant. With this funding, they sent Tanya's clothing to the Utah State Crime Lab for advanced DNA analysis. The examination yielded a significant breakthrough, the discovery of DNA from several men on her clothing. The revelation of multiple DNA profiles led investigators to consider all possible sources, including the long-deceased suspect, Owen Hodges Kimball. Although Kimball had passed away by taking his own life in 1965, his remains still held the potential to provide crucial evidence. Investigators made the decision to pursue a DNA sample from Kimball's body, 
believing that his DNA could be the key to solving the case. To proceed, they needed legal authorization, so they filed an ex parte order, a court request granted with only one side's approval, allowing investigators to act swiftly without delay. The court approved the order, and on November 2, 2023, nearly 60 years after his demise, Kimball's body was exhumed. His remains were sent to the Utah Medical Examiner's Office, where DNA samples were collected for analysis. The samples were then processed by both the Utah State Crime Lab and the Bode Technology Group. In June 2024, the results were conclusive. Kimball's DNA matched the DNA found on Tanya's clothing, providing the crucial link investigators had long sought. With this groundbreaking evidence in hand, investigators revisited the numerous statements and physical evidence collected during the original 1965 investigation. The newly obtained DNA evidence, when combined with the historical findings, painted a clear and indisputable picture of what had transpired that fateful night. It became evident that Kimball was indeed responsible for the brutal slaying of Tanya Weber. The evidence against him was overwhelming, and had he been alive, it would have been more than sufficient to obtain a guilty verdict beyond a reasonable doubt. The conclusion of the investigation brought long-awaited closure to Tanya's family and the community of Logan. The truth had finally emerged after 59 years, bringing an end to a case that had haunted the town for generations. Rhonda Christensen, Tanya's sister, and her family were attending a reunion in Idaho when police located them and told them what took place. Rhonda explained, The policeman came in and asked for my parents. They took them outside and told them what happened. There was a lot of support from our extended family. Words cannot express the gratitude from myself, my sister Julie, and my brothers Stephen and David. We are just so grateful to believe that she can finally rest in peace. When Stephen Weber, Tanya's brother talks about June 26, 1965. He still gets emotional. He was 10 years old, but remembers the day like it was yesterday. He said, It was just really terrible. I just did not know quite how to handle it. He gave a big sigh of relief when asked how important it was to have his sister's perpetrator officially named. Stephen added that he has forgiven him, and he hopes this can bring closure to others close to the case too. Lieutenant Lemuel Earl was one of the lead investigators on the case all those years ago. He has been retired 24 years now, but said it was a case he could never get out of his mind. Earl said getting that call on the 59th anniversary of Tanya's demise was a personal payoff. I cannot tell you how much peace of mind I have. It took a lot of good hard work and effort, not just back in those days, but fellows today that stuck with it. Shayna L. Waller, a 26-year-old from Bell County, Texas, was a beacon of kindness, known for her generous spirit and the love she radiated to everyone she met. But on January 29, 2011, the light that Shayna brought into the world was brutally extinguished. The investigation that followed was filled with twists and turns, but after more than a decade, a breakthrough finally brought long-awaited answers. Shayna L. Waller was a loving daughter, cherished by her family for her unwavering kindness and the deep care she showed to those around her. However, beneath the surface of Shayna's seemingly perfect life, there were struggles and challenges that she kept hidden from those around her. Despite her cheerful exterior, she faced personal battles that weighed heavily on her heart. The pressures of life began to mount. But she remained resilient, determined to overcome whatever obstacles came her way. Then, on January 29, 2011, everything changed. On that fateful day, the life that Shayna had so carefully built began to unravel. The body of 26-year-old Shayna L. Waller was found discarded in a ditch along Quarry Road. A young woman's lifeless body, partially wrapped in a light green bedsheet, drenched in blood near her head. The eerie scene was made even more disturbing by the presence of a single rubber glove stained with blood lying nearby. Authorities immediately launched an investigation determined to uncover the truth behind Shayna's untimely demise. The discovery of the rubber glove suggested that the perpetrator had taken some steps to avoid leaving behind incriminating evidence. 
Yet there was hope that this clue might lead investigators closer to identifying the perpetrator. On June 30th, 2011, months after her body was discovered, the results of her autopsy were released. The report confirmed what investigators had feared. Shayna's demise was a brutal slaying. She had suffered multiple stab wounds all over her body, with particularly vicious injuries inflicted on her neck and abdomen. The sheer violence of the attack shocked even the most seasoned investigators, revealing the depth of the rage and malice behind the crime. Each new piece of evidence brought the investigators closer to the truth, but also deepened the mystery surrounding Shayna's final days. Despite the relentless efforts of the police, the case went cold, leaving her family and the community without answers for over a decade. In 2022, the Bell County Sheriff's Department made a surprising announcement. The cold case of Shayna L. Wallers had been reopened. Lead investigator Corey Powell, who had taken a personal interest in the case, spearheaded the renewed investigation. The passage of time had not diminished the department's determination to find Shayna's perpetrator, and advancements in forensic technology provided new tools to re-examine the evidence. The key to solving the mystery lay in the Texas Department of Public Safety, which had generated a DNA profile from the evidence collected at the crime scene back in 2011. The breakthrough came when the DNA profile was entered into the Combined DNA Index System, CODIS. After years of searching, a match was finally found. The DNA evidence pointed to a 56-year-old man named Alvin Dwayne Canton. The revelation was shocking, as Canton had never been on the radar of investigators during the initial investigation. With this new lead, detectives moved quickly to track him down, knowing they were closer than ever to solving the case. When confronted with the evidence, Canton consented to a blood draw, further confirming the match. The DNA found at the scene, particularly on the blood-stained rubber glove, was a crucial piece of evidence that tied him directly to the crime. Forensic analysis confirmed that the blood on the glove matched both Shayna's and Canton's DNA, leaving little doubt about his involvement in the crime. The discovery brought a sense of closure to the investigators, who had worked tirelessly on the case, as well as to Shayna's grieving family. Canton's arrest on March 6, 2024, marked a turning point in the long search for justice for Shayna. After 13 years, the persistence of law enforcement and the power of modern forensic science finally provided the answers that had eluded them for so long. Lead investigator Corey Powell said Shayna's mom was crying with excitement at the news of Canton's arrest. He said, being able to make the call to Shayna's mom it is just overwhelming when she says, I did not think this call would come because it has been 13 years. The excitement that she now gets to tell her family, Canton is now being held by the Carnes County Sheriff's Department on a $1 million bond. He is awaiting his arraignment and extradition back to Bell County. Peter Michael DiSabatino, born on October 22, 1992, in Newark, Delaware, overcame near-demise experiences as a child to become a vibrant, outgoing young man. Known for his leadership on the lacrosse field and his deep love for family, Peter's life seemed destined for greatness. But on November 12, 2012, his bright future was stolen in a moment of unimaginable betrayal. For over a decade, his case remained a haunting mystery. Peter Michael DiSabatino was born on October 22, 1992, to Angela Herman and Thomas DiSabatino. He survived two near-demise experiences in his early years, first at birth and again at the age of two, when he nearly drowned. At Apoquinimink High School, Peter's leadership and charisma shone through. As a co-captain of the lacrosse team for two years, he earned a reputation not only for his athletic skills, but also for his unwavering team spirit. Yet, there was more to Peter than just his athletic prowess. He was known for his mischievous nature, a rascal with a bit of spice to his personality. Whether it was a holiday celebration or a casual weekend barbecue, Peter thrived in the company of loved ones. 
However, on November 12, 2012, Peter's life took a dark and unexpected turn. That evening, Peter was at his apartment, enjoying the company of friends. The night seemed like any other, filled with laughter and the comfort of close companionship. But as the evening unfolded, Peter received a text message that would change everything. The message was from someone he knew, asking him to come outside and meet them. Trusting this person, Peter stepped out unaware that he was walking into a trap. What he thought was a friendly encounter was, in fact, a setup that would lead to his tragic demise. As Peter approached the meeting spot, the situation quickly escalated into violence. The peace of the night was shattered by the sound of gunshots echoing through the air. His friends, still inside the apartment, were jolted by the sudden, terrifying noise. They rushed outside, only to find Peter lying on the ground, gravely wounded. Desperate to save his life, they attempted to resuscitate him, performing CPR and mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, while others frantically dialed 911. The scene was chaotic, filled with fear and the gut-wrenching realization that their friend's life was slipping away. Emergency services responded quickly, with police being dispatched to the Studio Green Apartments on the 200 block of Thorn Lane in Newark. When officers arrived just before 9.30 p.m., they found Peter lying on the sidewalk, suffering from multiple gunshot wounds. The situation was dire, and despite the best efforts of the responding officers and paramedics, Peter's condition was critical. He was rushed to a nearby hospital, but the injuries he sustained were too severe. Tragically, Peter DiSabatino lost his life shortly after arriving at the hospital. For years, Peter's case remained an unsolved mystery. The Newcastle County Police's cold case unit took on the burden of keeping its case alive. The unit highlighted cases like Peter's to remind the public of the enduring pain suffered by the families left behind, who must carry on without answers or justice. Despite the passing years, the cold case slaying squad never gave up hope tirelessly re-examining evidence and re-interviewing witnesses in pursuit of the truth. There was an interview with the family in 2020, and they had the following to say. His father, Thomas D. Sabatino, said, He was a good kid, I was proud of him, still am, and I miss him very much. He expressed frustration at the case's current status, and said more evidence is needed to help bring his son's perpetrators to justice. It has been almost five years, and we know who they are, but there just is not enough evidence to give them what they deserve. His sister, Caroline, said, He just was happy to be alive. How could my baby brother be gone? His mother, Angela Herman, described the waking nightmare of having to both learn of her son's demise and then tell his sisters Peter was gone. She said, I just kept thinking, when I get there, somebody's going to take me in and show me that he is okay. They did not. When I got there, they took me back to another room. After they told me, after the girls came in, we had to tell them. Officials let us see him, but because it was a criminal case, I could not even touch him. I could not hold him one more time. I could not even hold his hand. The persistence of the investigators finally paid off in January 2024. The investigation reached a critical turning point. The cold case slaying squad in collaboration with the Delaware Department of Justice, made a breakthrough that would change everything. After carefully piecing together the evidence and revisiting key testimonies, detectives identified 33-year-old Alondo Dale as a suspect in Peter's case. This discovery reignited the case, providing the long-awaited lead that could finally bring closure to Peter's family. On January 16, 2024, the case was presented to a grand jury, backed by the unwavering support of the Delaware Department of Justice. The evidence was compelling enough to secure an indictment against Dale, charging him with slaying in the first degree. This indictment marked a significant milestone in the investigation, signaling that justice was within reach after more than a decade of uncertainty and heartache. The pursuit of justice culminated on January 29, 2024 when Dale was apprehended by the United States Marshals Task Force with assistance from the NCCPD Special Investigation Squad. He was subsequently arraigned in Newcastle County Superior Court, 
facing the grave charges of first-degree slaying and first-degree slaying caused during the commission of a felony. Bail was set at $1 million and he was transported to Howard R. Young Correctional Institution. For Peter's loved ones, Dale's arrest brought a sense of relief and the hope that justice, though delayed, would finally be served. Maurice Wright, a 28-year-old father of three with a bright future, was a man known for his kind heart and unwavering dedication to his family. On October 7, 2017, while preparing for his daughter's birthday party, Maurice's life took a devastating turn that no one could have foreseen. The shocking events of that fateful day lead to years of unanswered questions and then a long-awaited breakthrough that finally brought hope for justice. Maurice Wright was a 28-year-old resident of Bakersfield, California. A graduate of Highland High School, Maurice was a loving father of three who worked full-time to support his family. Life for Maurice seemed to be on a positive path as he worked hard to provide for his children and make their lives better. On October 7, 2017, Maurice's life took an unexpected turn. That day, he was busy preparing for his daughter's birthday party, a celebration that was meant to be filled with joy and laughter. After stopping at a local store to pick up food for the party, Maurice was ready to head home to finalize the preparations. The day held the promise of happiness, and Maurice, as always, wanted to make sure his daughter's special day was perfect. However, as he left the store, something unimaginable happened. Maurice, focused on getting home to his family, was unaware that this ordinary errand would be the beginning of a tragic chain of events. Around 8.30 p.m., Bakersfield police received a distressing call reporting a shooting near South King Street and East 3rd Street. Upon arriving at the scene, officers discovered two victims who had sustained gunshot wounds. The severity of their injuries ranged from moderate to major, indicating the seriousness of the situation. As first responders worked quickly to assess and assist the victims, the reality of the tragic event began to unfold. One of the victim's condition was critical. He was rushed to the hospital in an attempt to save his life, but the injuries proved too severe. Later that evening, the man succumbed to his wounds. It was not long before the identity of the deceased victim was confirmed. Family members came forward to identify the man who had tragically lost his life as Maurice Wright. Maurice, a father, son, and friend, was now another statistic in the ongoing violence that plagued the area. His life cut short in a senseless act that left everyone questioning why. As the investigation into Maurice's slain began, the Bakersfield Police Department immediately started gathering evidence and searching for suspects. Early on, authorities announced they were looking for three black males who had fled the scene in a dark SUV shortly after the shooting. Despite their efforts, the case remained unsolved for years, leaving Maurice's family and the community without answers or justice. The search for those responsible continued, but leads were scarce, and the case grew cold. In 2024, nearly seven years after that tragic night, a significant breakthrough occurred. Two suspects were arrested in connection with Maurice's case, reigniting hope for justice. Jemiah Dawson, 28, who was already in custody for an unrelated incident, became a key figure in the investigation. When questioned about the shooting on South King Street, Dawson initially denied involvement, but when detectives presented him with surveillance footage from the night of the incident, Dawson admitted to being one of the three suspected shooters. His confession marked a turning point in the long-standing case. Following Dawson's arrest, another suspect was apprehended. Trayvon Lee Foreman, also 28, was arrested in July 2024. He faced serious charges, including slaying, conspiracy, and gang participation in connection with Maurice Wright's demise. For Maurice's family, the news was bittersweet, a step toward justice, though it could never bring back the man they had lost. As the legal proceedings unfold, Maurice's memory will remain a poignant reminder of a life cut short by senseless violence and a testament to the enduring pursuit of justice.